Part 2 and into going into the deep end. Part 1 down below, what would you do here? I could tell Donna was signaling it was time for me to speak or ask anything, but I was still digesting her story. She broke the silence, saying, I'm really sorry. I want us to stay married. I love you. I know I messed up. If you want a divorce, I'll be devastated. But I won't contest it. I believe we can be fair about it. You can see the children whenever you wish. If you feel you need to even the score, I understand. I would dislike it, but you have my blessing to do what you need. Alternatively, you can let me prove my commitment to you every day, month, and year. My response was direct. This seems well thought out. She explained, ever since that incident, I've been anxious about the impact. I've considered our situation and prepared for the moment you found out. So, yes, I've been ready for a while. I hoped it wouldn't come to this, but I had my response planned. That was typical of Donna. She always rehearsed for public appearances, managing to appear genuine. That's what made her successful in her previous role. She was always rehearsed and ready. Only I could discern her authentic sincerity from her public persona because I truly knew her. If she had rehearsed this dialogue, practicing in front of a mirror as she often did, then every word was carefully chosen. Among her rehearsed words, I sought something that might help us move forward. What do you mean by making it up every day? It means I'll try to make amends for as long as I live. Whatever you ask, I'm willing to do. Her statement was broad. Everything. Within certain limits. I'll do things that make you happy. I'm willing to do all those things. Within limits. You can't confront the other person involved. The other person. You mean Craig. Not that I was planning to, but why shouldn't I? And using the other person doesn't really ease my mind. It implies something more significant. I used the other person because I thought his name might upset you more. Lover or boyfriend would have been too much, and he wasn't either. I didn't know how else to mention him without causing you pain, so I thought the other person was less hurtful. Should I just call him by his name? I appreciated her effort to be considerate of my feelings. Yet, the term the other person seemed to elevate his significance in her life. Let's stick with Craig. I can deal with that. So, why can't I confront him? It was my doing. I was the one who carried it on. So, are you trying to shield him? Not at all. It's our marriage I want to safeguard. I don't want you to lash out and make a decision that would entangle him in our lives permanently. He's out of the picture. I don't want his mistake to haunt us now. If you end up harming him and getting imprisoned, I'd be the one losing you. Moreover, while it might not seem like punishment to you, believe me, the blow to his pride was significant. You just have to take my word for it. I've never really been one for extreme actions. It's not that I lack the capacity for dark thoughts, rather, I value my own safety too much. But that didn't mean I wasn't interested in a form of retribution, albeit a less drastic one. Letting go of that desire would be a significant sacrifice, even though I trusted Donna's claim that she had shattered his self-image. I could empathize with how that would feel, as I've never been under the illusion of being a charmer myself. It was time to shift focus to more positive aspects. Are those the only terms? I get a say in everything else for the rest of our lives. Yes, anything you desire. Whenever you want, no disputes. Including, more adventurous intimacy. Yes, absolutely. You can have your way, and I'll go along with it, even pretend to enjoy it for your sake. I needed time to process. Dad had always cautioned me about the risk of my wife being drawn to someone else. Turns out, he was spot on. Naturally, he was the last person I wanted to discuss this with. Instead, I reached out to my lifelong buddy, Gantz. His real name was Armando Gonzalez, often called Mando, but to me, he's always been Gantz. We typically caught up during the week, yet this time, I needed my friend immediately. I phoned him, Gantz, hey, can we grab lunch today? Not the best time, I'm busy with a soundtrack for a local indie film. Gantz, I really need to talk. If you think you owe me any favors, now's the time to cash in. If not, I'll be in your debt after this. It's crucial. We ended up at our favorite spot, known for its exceptional margaritas and nachos. As usual, Gantz and I ordered both, though sometimes we'd skip the nachos. I sipped my mango margarita and then shared my burden with an eager Gantz. Donna was unfaithful. Gantz nearly choked on a tortilla chip, quickly taking a sip of his raspberry margarita to ease it down. What? Really? Does she have feelings for him? Used to. It's all in the past now. He's not even around here anymore. I shared the entire story with him. Gantz was completely engrossed. He can be quite attentive when the situation calls for it. He realized the gravity of the situation for me. After finishing, I explained the choices she had laid out for me, a comparable indiscretion or her making amends indefinitely. Gantz questioned, for the rest of her life, how does she plan to do that? She's willing to do whatever it takes, I said. And what exactly did she say? She said, everything. Gantz couldn't help but smirk and then asked, does that include every possible way to make it up? It includes every possible way, anywhere, anytime, I replied. Gantz raised his hand for a high five, and without thinking, I reciprocated, as I had done so many times before. I'm still undecided. I don't know if I can get past this. Gantz ordered another round and said, this is straightforward, my friend. How can you say it's straightforward? You're seeing this through the lens of hurt, not objectively. I was taken aback. Come on, you were a mess when Vanessa left you. 
That was my ordeal. It's tough to be unbiased about your own issues, but a friend can see things more clearly. You gave me solid advice back then, but you ignored it. I did, and I ended up in trouble for not heeding your advice. That's when I realized you were right. You should consider my perspective now. So what do you suggest? You two have something special. She. I interrupted him, saying, clearly, she doesn't have the same depth of feeling for me as I have for her. He retorted, I thought you were seeking my counsel, which means you need to listen. I will heed your advice and refrain from interrupting further. Look, you both love each other. Your main gripe is that she's too set in her ways. Now you have the chance to be with the woman you love, and perhaps she'll be more open to change. I replied, until she resents it. Then savor the moment. Trust her words. For once, you have the upper hand. And when things go south, and she fails to keep her promises. It might be a year, five years, or even ten. But even if it ends, you would have had an incredible journey. He's my best friend for a reason. I genuinely wanted my marriage to succeed. So, I decided to follow his suggestion. But figuring out where to begin was daunting. The possibilities seemed endless. I opted for a classic approach, often initiated by women in relationships. After putting the kids to bed that night, I told Donna, we need to talk. We sat together on the living room couch. She looked uneasy, so I took her hand to comfort her. I've thought over the choices you laid out. I don't favor any of them. There's no quick fix for this pain. I'm hurt. I understand, she said. I want us to remain together, to grow old with each other, and to be there for our children and future grandchildren. My love for you has only deepened over time. However, moving past what happened will take a while. So, I choose all of the above. I'm skeptical about your sincerity, but I'm willing to give it a shot. If you're truly committed, we'll overcome this. I'll be observant but not spiteful. If this arrangement fails, then we part ways. I will hold you accountable. A single failure, and it's over. I'm trusting your earnestness, and I need this to work. Donna gave me a kiss, not one of passion, but one filled with love. It's a kiss that anyone who has experienced knows well, the feeling of being the most significant person in her life. As she tenderly kisses you, affirming her love, I meant every word. Forever, I'm committed to doing what I promised. I never speak without reflecting first, and this has been on my mind for ages. I'm actually looking forward to it. That night, we just held each other close, seeking comfort and reassurance in each other's presence, without any further intimacy. It felt like that was all we needed, to be in each other's embrace and feel that everything would be alright. Come morning, I was eager to see how strong her promise was. The potential for what lay ahead excited me. I had no doubts about her sincerity. Now, I was curious to see if her commitment would endure. Our first venture was shopping for lingerie. I had never chosen lingerie for Donna before. She was particular about what she wore and preferred to make her own selections. But this time, we shopped together and I selected a few options for her to choose from. She didn't choose my top pick, yet I was content with her choice. Then came the backyard makeover. Did I ever mention my fascination with pirates? I installed a flagpole and hoisted a Jolly Roger, transforming our backyard into a pirate haven, complete with a redesigned pool featuring sharks, alligators, and dolphins. Donna found it somewhat silly, but the kids were thrilled. Whenever Donna hesitated, I just had to say all of the things, and it would resolve any major disagreement. A simple AOTT was all it took to settle things in my favor. I even managed to sway the smaller decisions. For instance, I've always enjoyed karaoke, a hobby Donna never shared. Despite lacking the voice of an angel, I took delight in singing, especially performing songs like Sex Bomb, much to Donna's amusement. Sure, I embodied the stereotype of a rhythm-challenged white man, but the fun was in the experience, not the judgment. Come Halloween, I went all out decorating our home with tombstones and convincing Donna to don scary costumes with me, zombies one year, vampires the next, and then scary clowns. Vacations were another highlight. I finally got to take Donna and the kids on adventures she used to avoid, like whitewater rafting, ensuring it was safe, of course. The kids had a blast, and while Donna had her concerns, it all went well. I was skeptical about her sticking to her promise, but Donna proved resilient. Whenever we disagreed, she didn't hesitate to voice her opinion. And if we reached a deadlock, I'd end the dispute with AOTT, our agreed-upon trump card. It took time for me to realize that not every new challenge would be the breaking point. In our intimate life, we explored boundaries, and while it was clear she did it more for my sake than her own enjoyment, her willingness to try meant the world to me. Her humorous approach, like the playful note she left, was as significant to me as the act itself. It was about the shared experience and understanding between us. I also acquired Blu-rays of every show featuring Carmen. Despite Donna's okay, I thought watching these on a shared streaming account might seem insensitive. Plus, Blu-rays offered interviews and unseen footage, which I enjoyed in private, tucked away in my desk during Donna's absences. Some of these shows were gems I had missed, and others, admittedly, were not great. Raising our children was an aspect I wished to influence more. Previously, I had often deferred to Donna, but now I felt it was time to reevaluate. For instance, Allison wanted to attend cheerleading camp, which Donna strongly opposed, claiming it objectified women. 
I saw this as stifling her interests. She's young, and for her, it's about fun and performance, perhaps something we should support. It's not about being objectified at her age, we should let her choose, I argued. Donna was not pleased, but I stood my ground, using the argument again for our son, Nick, who showed interest in playing soccer. He wasn't naturally sporty, but he enjoyed the game, possibly influenced by his mother's sports journalism background. Donna's concerns shifted to safety, specifically concussions. I countered, kids playing soccer isn't the main risk for concussions. They're more likely to get hurt doing something like climbing a tree. I wasn't entirely sure of the facts but felt confident in my reasoning. Following Gantz's advice turned out to be beneficial. Life was good with my loving family. I had forgiven Donna, and we were happy, though unbeknownst to me, Donna was finding it increasingly difficult to maintain our arrangement over time. Our routine included date nights, usually on Fridays, to accommodate my sporadic weekend work. We preferred to call our clients clients, avoiding the term customers which seemed outdated. We'd hire Shelly, the teenage neighbor, as our babysitter, ensuring we returned by 10 p.m. These nights were not weekly but cherished moments for just the two of us. However, we never overextended our time out, mindful of the trust placed in a young babysitter. The first hint of trouble in our arrangement surfaced during one of these evenings. We were at a karaoke bar, and I had just aced the Elvis tune, Can't Help Falling in Love. My eyes were on Donna throughout the performance. After I stepped down from the stage, she gave me a quick peck on the lips. It caught me off guard, making me slightly uneasy, so I didn't reciprocate the kiss. She pulled back and remarked, thanks for singing that song. It was so captivating. You really moved me. That peck and her words stirred something inside me. Returning to our table, I knew Donna noticed the effect and I was prepared to assure her that it was all unexpected and meaningless. However, before I could speak, Donna remarked as I sat down, that woman is pretty. Her tone took me by surprise. It felt odd, almost as if she was pleased about my encounter. Sure, it would be typical of her to appreciate such a moment with me, but saying that woman is pretty was out of character for Donna. I simply responded, yes, she is, but not as much as you, and gave her a kiss before sitting down. I was uncertain about where this conversation was heading and hoped it would end there. She kissed you. I know. I was there. Did you see her appearance? I think she's naturally beautiful. They look fine. They're not just fine, they're stunning. Perfect, even. Responding to that felt awkward. Yes, the woman was attractive, but I was expected to maintain that my wife was the most beautiful. I cautiously said, they seem above average. If I were a man, I'd be drawn to her. Even as a woman, I might be intrigued for a while. Donna's enthusiasm was unusual. She didn't appear jealous of the other woman's beauty, rather, she seemed to admire it. Donna had mentioned other women's appearances before but never in such a suggestive manner. I couldn't deny the woman's allure based on her visible features. The term perfection felt odd, as one couldn't really tell just from appearances. The whole situation was perplexing. Later, I discussed it with my friend Gantz. Gantz was straightforward. Was she appealing to you? Absolutely. Do you think she was instigating this situation? Could this be her thing now? It's never been her thing. Until now, perhaps. Gantz gave a friendly tap to a server as she walked by. He took a moment to exchange numbers with her before he continued. You know, Donna is struggling with what she's agreed to. It's like wearing something that doesn't fit right. It's uncomfortable. I understood Gantz's point, but it was still shocking to me. I questioned, so, she's so eager to change things that she wants me to be with another woman. That's what I'm getting at. I doubted Gantz's words. The idea of Donna wanting me to be with someone else, while everything seemed fine between us, was hard to grasp. I couldn't believe she would prefer that over keeping things as they were. I had always been fair in my expectations. If she had issues, she never showed them. Part of our understanding was that she would go along with my requests without objection. So, it was difficult to gauge her true feelings. I decided to be more observant, and soon enough, I noticed a pattern. On one of our date nights, Donna suggested a new spot named Grand Tetons. As soon as we entered, the theme of the place became obvious, and notably, there were only female servers. Layla, our waitress, who was quite noticeable, approached us and immediately acknowledged Donna, is this the wonderful husband you've talked about? That's him. He's a great find. I can tell, she replied, turning to me. Donna has good things to say about you. What can I get for you today? Her words were plain, but the situation felt loaded. I ordered two beers from a local brewery, always keen to support local enterprises. We'll start with this, still deciding on the food. Layla nodded, take your time. Choosing the right meal is important. We can't just settle for anything. Her comment was straightforward, yet her mannerisms suggested more, especially as she leaned forward, giving a clear view of her appearance. This repetition of events made it clear that it wasn't just happenstance. It was becoming a noticeable trend. I'd been to these themed restaurants before, but the level of suggestive behavior was something else, more akin to a risque cabaret atmosphere. Donna appeared completely unaffected by it all. So when Layla exited, her walk notably confident in form-fitting shorts, I casually inquired, So, how do you know Layla? She's a fellow sorority sister. I was around during her initiation. She was really thankful to meet me. 
but it seemed like she was more captivated by you than by me, even though I had quite the reputation in our circle. That notion seemed utterly absurd. Sure, I was secretly pleased by the attention, but I found Donna's narrative as improbable as landing on an isle populated by enchanting women who had never encountered a man and were instantly enamored with me, as if I were some kind of mythological hero. I remained silent. On our drive home, we skirted around that particular topic. I felt Donna was eager for me to bring it up, and it was obvious she was bothered by my silence. After settling things with Shelley and ensuring the kids were all right, we headed to bed. The evening's experiences had left me feeling somewhat stirred, which is a reluctant admission to one's spouse, yet it's something she probably already sensed. Also, the evening's events had left me feeling uneasy. Once more, I gave her a pet goodnight, trying to conceal my physical arousal. I turned away to sleep, to avoid any unintentional contact. Yet, she cuddled up behind me, a familiar gesture but her whispers were unexpected. Layla's quite something, huh? She murmured. I felt wary, unsure of the underlying intentions. Pretending to be weary, I replied, she's good looking. But not as much as you, followed by a forced yawn. Donna playfully bit my ear, she seemed quite taken with you. She's so youthful, probably quite adventurous, too. I've heard she's quite unrestrained. This was a side of Donna I hadn't seen before. I was always concerned about her being enticed away, yet here she was expressing her own doubts. However, I quickly realized this was not about her insecurities. Donna was never one to doubt herself. For some reason, she was prompting thoughts of another. Her subtle bites and the reminder of Layla's allure made concentration difficult. I decided to clarify things. Donna, even if you're considering it, I must decline. I value our exclusive commitment, and changing that would make me uneasy, regardless of the circumstances. I braced for her reaction. Donna stopped momentarily, then continued with a soft kiss on my neck. It's not about me, you know I'm not into that. Her gentle nibbles continued, as she knew exactly how to affect me. I let her vent for a while, feeling a mix of amusement and tension. Then, with a touch of irony, I asked, So, you think I should pursue someone else? Would it solve our problems? This abruptly halted her outburst. Yes, yes, just do it. I admit, it was my idea. I'm the one who suggested it. Just go ahead, no hard feelings. Let's return to normal, where we discuss and agree on things together. I can't handle this situation anymore. It was a passionate plea. How could one react to that? Clearly, intimacy was off the table following her outburst. Donna had initiated a scenario she now regretted. Despite the tension, I found a twisted satisfaction in the situation. I had no real desire to be with anyone else, as Donna and I still shared a strong connection. So, how do you comfort someone who urges you to be with another, just to escape a predicament she created? I simply embraced her, offering silent support, which seemed to be the perfect response at that moment. Life resumed its usual rhythm. I became more attuned to Donna's preferences, indulging them with added zeal, yet I remained firm on the significant matters. I sensed her feeling of powerlessness and tried to show my love within these new dynamics. We seemed to have found a stable ground, with Donna appreciating that I valued our shared life over fleeting temptations. Then, one day at work, I received a call from a Mrs. Snader from Phoenix, inquiring about a specialized pool. Our conversation was ordinary, except her voice sparked a faint recognition. Upon meeting her, the puzzle pieces clicked. She was Carmen, wearing casual attire suitable for the desert heat, looking effortlessly appealing. I was taken aback, recognizing her but not connecting her to the Snader name immediately. Carmen greeted me, you must be Donna's husband. Her tone was amiable, her smile genuine, yet her eyes conveyed a hidden animosity. I responded affirmatively, caught in the awkwardness of the situation. Carmen, masking her true feelings with pleasantries, expressed her fond memories of their college days, inviting me in with an air of forced friendliness. I walked in behind her, still reeling from the realization. This was the woman I'd admired from afar, someone I'd only ever seen on screens. Donna was familiar too, but in a completely different way. She was a professional, a journalist delivering the news. Carmen, on the other hand, was an actress known for her bold and provocative roles. I always thought her performances were just that, performances, even though they seemed incredibly realistic. Carmen led me to the backyard, where a pool was already in place. In this city, a pool was a common luxury for those who could afford it. This pool looked like any other in the neighborhood, nothing out of the ordinary. It made sense that she, or perhaps her husband, wanted to stand out. They had seen the lavish pools of the rich and famous and likely wanted something that made a statement. I was there to help make that happen, and it wasn't my first time upgrading a pool for someone in her circle. Carmen's behavior was overtly flirtatious, to put it mildly. Her actions were subtly provocative, like bending over in a way that revealed more of herself, or finding reasons to lean close during our conversation about the pool designs, her attire barely concealing her form. She even went as far as to touch me playfully. I tried to stay focused on the task at hand. Encounters like this weren't new to me, after all, Carmen was known for her seductive image. Perhaps she was aiming for a discount. I found myself physically reacting, which Carmen quickly noticed. 
While I was stammering over the details of the pool renovation, she teasingly suggested I might need a moment to compose myself. I was mortified, barely managing to respond before she playfully accused me of fantasizing about her. I haven't, I replied truthfully. At that moment, I realized that Donna was the only woman who mattered in my thoughts. Pushing aside any further contemplation seemed wise, considering the tension with Carmen. Despite what might be expected, my thoughts were loyal to Donna alone. She laughed it off, seemingly amused by the thought of being a fantasy for many. I clarified, sincerely, that my focus had shifted solely to Donna since we started dating. In my mind, it was always Donna, regardless of the situation. Carmen seemed skeptical, or perhaps intrigued, by my fidelity to Donna. It's unfortunate, but I'm really only interested in someone who is captivated by my image, even in their private moments. I'm not sure why I blurted out the next thing. Maybe it was a desperate attempt to change the subject. I tend to think about women in abstract ways, I said, which wasn't entirely true. My imagination had run wild with various fictional characters, from animated bombshells to lesser-known figures. I thought I was deflecting the conversation. Then she took off her blouse. Her figure was as timeless as any photo, unaffected by the years, unlike Donna, who had the natural changes of motherhood. It wasn't a fair comparison. I could have laughed it off as a joke, but I didn't. Instead, I remarked, that's still not everything, clinging to the idea that I was looking for a way out. It was naive to assume she wouldn't reveal more, given her history on screen. Perhaps I was just delaying, seeking an exit. As I hesitated, she undressed completely, methodically. There were moments I could have stepped back, but I was transfixed. I had seen her on screen persona in various states of undress. Now, in person, she caught my gaze, understanding my thoughts. I'm preparing for a role in a retro-themed movie. You've seen mine, now it's your turn. She had seen through my facade, and now I was at a crossroads. What next? With some effort, due to my nervousness, I lowered my pants. This felt more exposing than any youthful embarrassment. My experiences had never been this direct. Carmen observed with an intense gaze as I, finally, faced the situation directly. Show me, she said. That moment felt decisive, a point of no return. I acted, driven by the intensity of the situation, aware of her focused attention. As the tension built, her anticipation was clear. Let's see the climax, she urged. I quickened my pace, facing the challenge of limited smoothness. Determined, I thought I'd owe myself an apology later. I aimed to impress her with my intensity. Silently focused, I continued until the climax splashed onto the floor, surprisingly abundant. While the quantity might not matter to others, it gave me a sense of achievement. Why don't you clean up while I take care of this mess? Retreating to the bathroom, I attended to personal hygiene to avoid any discomfort later. Checking my reflection, I ensured my appearance was still intact. Upon returning, I found Carmen fully dressed, which dampened my spirits momentarily. Yet, her words quickly lifted them, I think you are the right man for what I want. You're hired. Her tone hinted at intriguing possibilities ahead. Later, I recounted the event to Gauntz. It was wild. She just sat there, suggesting I pleasure myself, guiding me through it. Gauntz was intrigued, did she join in? No, she stayed clothed, simply observing, directing me to the finish line. His curiosity peaked, and then. Just me, really, and then we tidied up. Gauntz's expression conveyed mixed feelings, like a friend hesitant to share unwelcome news. That's quite the tale, he concluded. Yeah, it was something you had to experience. Gantz ordered another round before he continued, so you just did that in front of her. You just broke your promise. What do you mean? You crossed a line. I tried to explain it to him. It's not crossing a line. She wants me to come back, so it could lead to something. Maybe. So you can act out while she watches in every room in the house. Celebrating in the kitchen by acting out while the undressed woman watches and applauds. Wow. Living the dream, Gantz raised his glass in a toast. Oh no. I messed up, didn't I? Gantz gave me his not judging, but judging look. That look always meant for me to pause before responding and think about things. While I was doing just that, he said, think about what you're giving up. All of the things. All of them. I did think about it in the few seconds I had to consider it. My answer was, yeah, but it's Carmen Legaretta. Is one person worth giving up everything you have? It's Carmen Legaretta. That should have settled the argument, as far as I was concerned. How special can she be? Does she have some kind of magic charm? Come on. Wouldn't you consider it for her? No, she's attractive, but so are other women. She's not even that talented. I bristled a bit here. I think she's good for the role she's cast in. Yeah, but you said good, not great. The attraction you feel is a fantasy from watching her on screen. You have been happy. For years you've been telling me how thrilled you've been with Donna supporting everything you want. You really want to give up that part of your life for a fantasy. I said in my calm voice, Gantz. You make a great point. I appreciate your wisdom. It was very good advice. It really was. I ignored it. I mean, since when had Gantz been the voice of reason in my life? After that incident, I had to act as if everything was normal with Donna. Technically, Carmen and I hadn't crossed any lines, but still, I found it difficult to behave as if nothing was amiss. Organizing my three-week getaway with Carmen required careful planning. 
I booked a flight to Florida under the guise of meeting a client, followed by a return trip to Phoenix. Indeed, I had the opportunity to be intimate with someone else. I could have been upfront with Donna about my intentions with Carmen. Yet, I couldn't bring myself to be honest. It was a complex web of deceit. First, I wasn't entirely sure what would transpire. Second, Carmen was Donna's adversary. So, I stuck to the story of traveling to Florida for work. My justifications were piling up. In my mind, I was sparing Donna's feelings and maintaining the facade of professionalism. But, deep down, I was avoiding the truth about my intended meetup with Carmen, the last person Donna would suspect. When Donna offered to drive me to the airport, I politely refused. The thought of her driving me to a potential encounter with Carmen, her archenemy, was too much. Technically, she would be dropping me off for a flight to Florida, but the underlying reality made me uncomfortable. Upon reaching Carmen's place, I was unsure of what to expect. Carmen remarked, you're not here about the pool. Actually, I was there under that pretext. Indeed, my art is my focus. However, Carmen's tone suggested something more, which made me question my intentions. Her every word seemed to be laced with allure. She offered a seemingly innocent smile, yet her voice hinted at something else. I understand. You produce quality art. I felt nervous as I responded. That's my reason for being here. Carmen then shifted from suggestive hints to more direct probing. If that's the sole reason, you may as well leave. Plenty of others can design pools. Is that your final decision? Her tone was a mix of challenge and disinterest, as if it didn't matter to her either way, yet also conveying a desire for me to stay. It took me a moment, but I realized she was prompting me to express my attraction to her. I was here hoping for a mutual desire. Caught in my conflicted thoughts, I decided to be frank. I stated, I'm here to design a pool for you. But if there's no chance for an extraordinary experience, let's cut the charade. Second best, she queried. Donna was always the pinnacle for me. Whatever the activity, there was an inescapable sense of comfort and familiarity with her. I see this as a friendly rivalry, and I'm thankful for your candor. Allow me to create a situation where I could possibly be second to her, I said, embracing the challenge. Harmon seemed to catch my drift instantly. She managed to persuade me to let her have a go at being second best, echoing my own phrase. There I was, restrained on the bed, completely at her mercy. She positioned herself above me, teasingly close yet just out of reach. You've dreamed about this moment, she declared, her tone suggesting it was a well-known fact. Her manner of speaking sparked excitement in both of us, and I found myself eagerly agreeing. Without the ability to articulate my thoughts further, I simply responded, yes. My attempts to connect were met with playful denial, as she moved just beyond my reach each time. Do you desire this? She teased softly. Yes, I whispered, my voice filled with yearning. I was desperate to close the distance between us but the restraints held firm. Unlike with Donna, I couldn't break free, I was utterly at her mercy. She edged closer again, allowing me a fleeting taste, then withdrew. I didn't catch your reply. Shall I assume it's a no? She teased, struggling against my bonds, I asserted, Carmen, I do. I truly do. Yet again, she hovered just out of reach, continuing to taunt me. You say the words, but can you prove your desire? My frustration grew as she remained tantalizingly elusive, her touch reserved for herself alone. Carmen, I want you, I called out, no longer able to contain my voice. Louder, she demanded, fueling the intensity of the moment. I had always been moderate in expressing myself intimately. Vocal, yes, but never loud, considering Donna and I had children. However, with Carmen, I couldn't hold back. Carmen, I desire you intensely. As she came closer, her words were an invitation, indulge in me. A part of me feared she might withdraw, but that fear quickly passed as she stayed. Her words turned sparse, punctuated by their, more, and sighs of ecstasy while I was lost in the moment with her. Then she was with me in a way I had longed for. A pressing question crossed my mind. Are you on birth control? She hesitated, creating a tension before replying, does it matter given our similarities? But it matters to us, I responded. Her movement paused, questioning, should I stop? The prudent answer would have been affirmative, to avoid any complicated consequences. Yet, what escaped my lips was an unrestrained no. Gratefully, she continued, and her words became more daring. I was caught in the moment, not pondering the truth behind her words. In that instant, nothing else mattered. The next morning, I awoke alone, the euphoria of the night before replaced by a stark solitude and the echo of her words. The reality of the evening's events hit me hard as I left the bedroom, finding Carmen in the kitchen, casually dressed, embodying a serene domesticity. Her simple good morning carried an electric charge, mixing my anxiety with an undeniable attraction. I managed to ask about coffee, to which she responded positively, continuing her morning routine. I poured myself a cup of coffee, and it was delightful. The flavor was rich and complex, as if crafted by masterful French chefs, yet it carried an invigorating zest reminiscent of Ethiopian heritage, hinting at the coffee's storied origins. Carmen presented two stunning omelets, and eating them felt heavenly. The ingredients were a mystery, but the taste was divine. Midway through my second cup, I expressed concern about the possibility of an unintended pregnancy. 
Carmen, with a laugh and a reassuring touch, informed me she was on birth control, minimizing such risks. Relieved, I questioned why she teased about the topic. She found the thrill appealing, which left me pondering the allure of such risks. That month was intensely passionate and full of activity, though not exclusively so, we balanced our time with other tasks, including planning for a pool. Carmen was open about her preferences, which was new to me compared to past relationships. Reflecting on our time together, I acknowledged my complex feelings and the guilt I harbored. The affair, especially with someone my wife disliked, was thrilling yet burdened with remorse. Returning to Florida, I grappled with the notion of confessing to Donna. Despite her past openness to the idea of an affair, I dreaded the forthcoming conversation. Upon reaching Phoenix, I found my luggage, avoiding the ironic misfortune of losing it. Donna wasn't there to meet me, a reminder of our frequent travels and the normalcy of solitary arrivals. I hailed a taxi and headed home. My pirate flag was missing. It had always been a prominent feature in the backyard, but now it was absent. Where did the pirate flag go? The moment you chose to be with Carmen Lagaretta, I removed it. I hesitated, avoiding a direct answer. Her name is Carmen Snader now, actually. I couldn't care less. We had an agreement. You were unfaithful with her for two weeks. Hence, the pirate flag is gone. It was really nine days, which is closer to a week than two. I thought about correcting her, but she continued passionately. You'll also notice some blue rays missing from your collection. I threw those out, and they're probably in a landfill by now. That seems a bit much, you could have donated them or passed them on. I wanted to break them and leave them for you to discover. You should be thankful for my incredible restraint. Her use of that phrase showed how angry she was. I wondered if I had gone too far in my choice of partner. I knew getting involved with Carmen was risky, but I didn't anticipate this level of intensity. Listen, Donna, I'm not finished. Our special anniversary celebration is over. From now on, the only thing similar will be if I decide to use a toy. It appeared that aspect of my life was over. She paused, so I quickly asked, how did you find out about Carmen and me? And then added hastily, I was going to tell you, just for the record. It should be Carmen and I found out because I asked her to lure you. I didn't think she'd have trouble. Then I told her to go ahead and try her best with you. And don't start with how much time you spent together. I bet it was more often than my occasions with Craig. Also, I'm done doing karaoke duets with you. She mentioned the last part as if it were just as significant, and to Donna, it probably was. My mind was reeling with information. It seemed there might still be hope for my marriage. I confronted her about reaching out to someone she claimed to dislike. You asked her for help, but you can't stand her. Why would you ask her for a favor, and why would she agree to it? She replied, to answer the second question first, she would agree because it boosts her ego to see me asking for a favor. It's a power play for her. Now, for your first question, she's the only one you've been fixated on. I thought if you got involved with her, we could reset our relationship and start as equals. That was a lot to take in. The idea of being equals was new to me. I always felt incredibly fortunate to be with Donna. Then, I reflected on my interactions with Carmen. I had never sensed any ulterior motives from her. I was mistaken about her intentions, thinking she was genuinely interested in me. It's unfortunate she hasn't received recognition for her acting skills. And your first point, I asked. I couldn't bear it any longer. The situations you wanted became more and more outlandish. It felt like torture, but you wouldn't get involved with anyone else. I thought the only way to make it happen was with Carmen. Carmen, who's that? Carmen, you fool, she exclaimed. I was momentarily taken aback by the nickname Carsla. Carmen and I had never been involved in that way. A wave of regret passed through me, but I realized that wasn't Donna's point. I understand now. I'm relieved to have moved past that. Phew. Donna seemed pleased with my acknowledgement of her superiority in our relationship. I'm glad that's settled. You've seen now how she doesn't compare to me. Choosing my words carefully, I affirmed, there's truly no one like you. Her smile widened as she sensed my agreement. Good, then enjoy the limited time you have left with her, just for the pool project. Step out of line, and we're heading for divorce. I managed a weak smile, so, this is where everything ends. Not everything, she clarified, just some things. There are a few aspects we should retain. That night, she was gently restrained and exposed on the bed. I ran a feather duster along her skin, reigniting a familiar thrill within me. Her excitement was palpable. Donna was eagerly anticipating my next move. I positioned myself close to her, teasing her, which left her wanting more. I understood that desire all too well. Despite relinquishing some aspects of our relationship, I wasn't truly discontent. The essentials, the core of what mattered, were still intact. My comment, do you think OP picked the correct woman or not? Would you have made the same choice? Comment down below, check out the other recent videos and I will see you in the next one.